Hi there. I think it's great that you're at episode number 150, and it's my pleasure to read to you today 1 Samuel 20, Psalm 103, our second reading in Romans 7, and the first four verses of Romans 8. May the Lord bless you real good today, and let's start in 1 Samuel 20. Yesterday, we heard the slow escalation of David's problems stemming from Saul's jealousy. Saul made David his son-in-law, but only because of the hope that David would be killed by the Philistines. For only the first time in yesterday's reading, we heard how Saul was humbled because of the results of acting on his jealousy. But he doesn't learn from it. 1 Samuel 20 Then David fled from Nioth in Ramah and went to Jonathan. He asked him, What have I done? What crime have I committed? What wrong have I done to your father to make him want to kill me? Jonathan answered, God forbid that you should die. My father tells me everything he does, important or not, and he would not hide this from me. It just isn't so. But David answered, Your father knows very well how much you like me, and he has decided not to let you know what he plans to do, because you would be deeply hurt. I swear to you by the living Lord that I am only a step away from death. Jonathan said, I'll do anything you want. David replied, Tomorrow is the new moon festival and I'm supposed to eat with the king. But if it's all right with you, I will go and hide in the fields until the evening of the day after tomorrow. If your father notices that I am not at the table, tell him that I begged your permission to hurry home to Bethlehem, since it's the time for the annual sacrifice there for my whole family. If he says, All right, I will be safe, but if he becomes angry, you will know that he is determined to harm me. Please do me this favor and keep the sacred promise you made to me. But if I'm guilty, kill me yourself. Why take me to your father to be killed? Jonathan answered, Don't even think such a thing. If I knew for sure that my father was determined to harm you, wouldn't I tell you? David then asked, Who will let me know if your father answers you angrily? Let's go out to the fields, Jonathan answered. So they went, and Jonathan said to David, May the Lord God of Israel be our witness. At this time tomorrow and on the following day I will question my father. If his attitude toward you is good, I will send you word. If he intends to harm you, may the Lord strike me dead if I don't let you know about it and get you safely away. May the Lord be with you as he was with my father, and if I remain alive, please keep your sacred promise to me and be loyal to me. But if I die, show the same kind of loyalty to my family forever. And when the Lord has completely destroyed all your enemies— May our promise to each other still be unbroken. If it is broken, may the Lord punish you. Once again, Jonathan made David promise to love him, for Jonathan loved David as much as he loved himself. Then Jonathan said to him, Since tomorrow is the new moon festival, your absence will be noticed if you aren't at the meal. The day after tomorrow, your absence will be noticed even more. So go to the place where you hid yourself the other time and hide behind the pile of stones there. I will then shoot three arrows at it as though it were a target. Then I will tell my servant to go and find them. And if I tell him, Look, the arrows are on this side of you. Get them. That means that you are safe and can come out. I swear by the living Lord that you will be in no danger. But if I tell him, The arrows are on the other side of you, then leave, because the Lord is sending you away. As for the promise we have made to each other, the Lord will make sure that we will keep it forever. 
sowed David hid in the fields. At the new moon festival, King Saul came to the meal and sat in his usual place by the wall. Abner sat next to him, and Jonathan sat across the table from him. David's place was empty. But Saul said nothing that day because he thought, Something has happened to him, and he is not ritually pure. On the following day, the day after the new moon festival, David's place was still empty, and Saul asked Jonathan, Why didn't David come to the meal either yesterday or today? Jonathan answered, He begged me to let him go to Bethlehem. Please let me go, he said, because our family is celebrating the sacrificial feast in town, and my brother ordered me to be there. So then, if you are my friend, let me go and see my relatives. That's why he isn't here in his place at your table. Saul became furious with Jonathan and said to him, How rebellious and faithless your mother was! Now I know you're taking sides with David and are disgracing yourself and that mother of yours. Don't you realize that as long as David is alive, you will never be king of this country? Now go and bring him here. He must die. Why should he die? Jonathan replied. What has he done? At that, Saul threw his spear at Jonathan to kill him. And Jonathan realized that his father really was determined to kill David. Jonathan got up from the table in a rage and ate nothing that day, the second day of the new moon festival. He was deeply distressed about David because Saul had insulted him. The following morning, Jonathan went to the fields to meet David as they had agreed. He took a young boy with him and said to him, Run and find the arrows I'm going to shoot. The boy ran, and Jonathan shot an arrow beyond him. When the boy reached the place where the arrow had fallen, Jonathan shouted to him, The arrow is farther on. Don't just stand there. Hurry up. The boy picked up the arrow and returned to his master, not knowing what it all meant. Only Jonathan and David knew. Jonathan gave his weapons to the boy and told him to take them back to town. After the boy had left, David got up from behind the pile of stones, fell on his knees, and bowed with his face to the ground three times. Both he and Jonathan were crying as they kissed each other. David's grief was even greater than Jonathan's. Then Jonathan said to David, God be with you. The Lord will make sure that you and I and your descendants and mine will forever keep the sacred promise we have made to each other. Then David left, and Jonathan went back to town. Let's turn to Psalm 103. How it must please the Lord when we pray this psalm, which is another favorite. Note that the psalm starts and ends with the same line. The Hebrew title is By David. Psalm 103 Praise the Lord, my soul, all my being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, my soul, and do not forget how kind he is. He forgives all my sins and heals all my diseases. He keeps me from the grave and blesses me with love and mercy. He fills my life with good things so that I stay young and strong like an eagle. The Lord judges in favor of the oppressed and gives them their rights. He revealed his plans to Moses and let the people of Israel see his mighty deeds. The Lord is merciful and loving, slow to become angry and full of constant love. He does not keep on rebuking. He is not angry forever. He does not punish us as we deserve or repay us according to our sins and wrongs. As high as the sky is above the earth, 
so great is his love for those who honor him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our sins from us. As a father is kind to his children, so the Lord is kind to those who honor him. He knows what we are made of. He remembers that we are dust. As for us, our life is like grass. We grow and flourish like a wild flower. Then the wind blows on it, and it's gone. No one sees it again. But for those who honor the Lord, His love lasts forever, and His goodness endures for all generations of those who are true to His covenant and who faithfully obey His commands. The Lord placed His throne in heaven. He is king over all. Praise the Lord, you strong and mighty angels, who obey his commands, who listen to what he says. Praise the Lord, all you heavenly powers, you servants of his who do his will. Praise the Lord, all his creatures, in all the places he rules. Praise the Lord, my soul. Today we will read most of Romans 7 and transition to chapter 8. The second key to being released from the power of sin is God's Spirit. Paul then launched into an exposition of what he meant in verse 5. For when we lived according to our human nature, the sinful desires stirred up by the law were at work in our bodies— and all we did ended in death. The explanation that extends from verse 7 to the end of the chapter should not be construed to negate what he said in verse 6, in the preceding chapters, and in chapter 8. Notice that in the second part of chapter 7, Paul stops mentioning Christ. That's a hint that he's not talking about our life in Christ. And then, I found it interesting to do a search of Romans, searching for the word spirit. Look at the pattern of where the word spirit is used. Romans 7, starting at verse 7. Shall we say then that the law is sinful? Of course not. But it was the law that made me know what sin is. If the law had not said, Do not desire what belongs to someone else, I would not have known such a desire. But by means of that commandment, sin found its chance to stir up all kinds of selfish desires in me. Apart from law, sin is a dead thing. I myself was once alive apart from law, but when the commandment came— Sin sprang to life, and I died. And the commandment which was meant to bring life, in my case, brought death. Sin found its chance, and by means of the commandment it deceived me and killed me. So then, the law itself is holy, and the commandment is holy, right, and good. But does this mean that what is good caused my death? By no means. It was sin that did it. By using what is good, sin brought death to me, in order that its true nature as sin might be revealed. And so, by means of the commandment, sin is shown to be even more terribly sinful. We know that the law is spiritual, but I am mortal sold as a slave to sin. I don't understand what I do, for I don't do what I would like to do, but instead I do what I hate. Since what I do is what I don't want to do, this shows that I agree that the law is right. 
So I'm not really the one who does this thing. Rather, it is the sin that lives in me. I know that good does not live in me, that is, in my human nature. For even though the desire to do good is in me, I'm not able to do it. I don't do the good I want to do. Instead, I do the evil that I don't want to do. If I do what I don't want to do, this means that I am no longer the one who does it. Instead, it is the sin that lives in me. So I find that this law is at work. When I want to do what is good, what is evil is the only choice I have. My inner being delights in the law of God. But I see a different law at work in my body, a law that fights against the law which my mind approves of. It makes me a prisoner to the law of sin which is at work in my body. What an unhappy man I am! Who will rescue me from this body that is taking me to death? Thanks be to God who does this, who rescues me through our Lord Christ Jesus. This, then, is my condition. On my own I can serve God's law only with my mind, while my human nature serves the law of sin. Romans 8 So then, there is no condemnation now for those who live in union with Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit, which brings us life in union with Christ Jesus, has set me free from the law of sin and death. What the law could not do, because human nature was weak, God did. He condemned sin in human nature by sending His own Son, who came with a nature like our sinful nature, to do away with sin. God did this that the righteous demands of the law might be fully satisfied in us who live according to the Spirit and not according to human nature. Let's pray together. Our Lord and our God, we say with David, Praise the Lord, O my soul. Lord, with all our being, we praise you and revere your name as holy. How worthy you are of our praise. Help us not to forget the many benefits you have given to us. Included in those are that your love for us lasts forever, and your goodness to us endures for all generations. Help us to be true to your new covenant, to faithfully follow your commands, and to highly honor you. As high as the sky is above the earth, so great is your love for us. As far as the east is from the west, so far do you remove our sins from us. Dear Lord Jesus, help us to understand our union with you. O Holy Spirit, give us understanding and change our hearts. We ask you to transform us. We lay down our lives, understanding that we have died with Christ and that you have resurrected us by your power. Lord, we pray that throughout this day you would enable us to lift our eyes from the sinful inclination of our minds and focus our gaze upon Christ Jesus.